Welcome to Exploring Digital with Per, a podcast for entrepreneurs and CEOs who want their businesses to benefit from a digital first approach. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Digital with Per. I'm joined today by Chris Davies, who's the founder at Harvest London. Hi, Chris. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Do you want to kick us off by explaining a little bit about your background and what is Harvest Farms and how you got into vertical farming? Sure, absolutely. Um, so my background um, is is really around kind of management consulting. Um, I w- I've been a management consultant for about 10 years. Um, and for those of your listeners that know anything about management consulting, that usually gives people existential crises or, or burnout. Um, I burnt out. Um, wanted to do something else. Um, and it was about three years ago that I got, I, I first heard about vertical farming. Um, it's a, it's a much older industry than that, but th- if you guys remember three years ago, prior to all this COVID stuff, we were deep in Brexit land and I couldn't understand why Brexit was happening. And at the same time, we were so dependent on Europe for the food supply in this country. And I really kind of saw the opportunity of what vertical farming can bring um, to the food system that we've created. So three years ago, um, started Harvest London. We're a vertical farming startup in London. um, And we work with our customers and our partners to improve the sustainability of their supply chain. What that really means is that we take a lot of the ingredients that you and I kind of take for granted that comes from Mexico, comes from Southeast Asia, comes from Europe, um, and we are removing the food mileage necessary of getting that food to us by growing the food in a warehouse in East London through vertical farming techniques. Um, vertical farming is um, a very, it's one of the ways in which um, we think there needs to be, it's one of the ways in which food production can be transformed um you know we definitely it's not the be all and end all in terms of how food can be produced we see it as part of an ecosystem of um farming activities there's always going to be a place for traditional agriculture um there's always going to be a place for greenhouse growing vertical farming is just the latest iteration of that but it's a very sustainable way of growing food so you know in the same amount of space you can grow hundreds of times the amount of produce as traditional farming. And you can do that using 95% less water, 95% less fertilizer, and be 100% pesticide free. Um, so, you know, if we're going to, if we as the human population is going to solve world hunger and feed, you know, uh, the billions of people that are going to be on this planet by 2050, then there needs to be a fundamental step change in how food is produced. So uh, you were mentioning that that's a challenge that came out of Brexit originally. Um, it's been an interesting year, I guess, for people talking about supply chains and, and suddenly being exposed to the idea that perhaps food or certain food products or elements of the supply chain could be in short shrift. And we, you know, we, there are uh, products that suddenly disappear um, from in terms of what's available. Was that something you experienced as a supplier of foods? Were there certain products that there was more demand for or certain elements of the supply chain that needed boosting this year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we all, we all, you know, prior to, prior to COVID with, with Brexit. So, um, 85% of the produce that we consume in this country comes from Europe. Um, knowing that Brexit was happening, um, you know, I think the, the myth of friction, frictionless trade has kind of been burst, right? No matter what happens, there is going to be friction. We've created a system where there is going to be friction. So, you know, needing to create a more sustainable system um, where we're more dependent and a more resilient system where we're less dependent on, 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 on external food supplies is very important. COVID reiterated that problem. Um, we all experienced, you know, people hoarding. We all experienced kind of empty shelves. Um, it was totally unnecessary to do all of that, but that's what people did. Um, and you know there was definitely a kind of increase in demand and we've definitely seen an uptick in terms of not only the demand for our produce but also kind of people's attitudes towards it they, they, they've kind of recognized that actually yeah there needs to be a, a change that we're not just going to survive on the stuff that naturally grows 
you know, in the UK. And, you know, we need to be able to create a more resilient food system. Is it a bit of a challenge in uh, w- with a startup in what is a very traditional world um, where a startup is is normally kind of uh, its advantage is its agility, right? And the ability to, to swap things out and change things. If a, if a crop fails or if, if you don't need a crop, you've got oversupply, all of those things, you still have to change things. And there is a lead time on that that's significant, right, in your world. Does, do you feel that's um, challenged you as a, as a startup to think differently about how you do things? That is a very, very good question. Um, we actually started off calling ourselves a high-tech allotment. Um, and the reason for that is because of the way that we worked. So we recognize that producing food, manufacturing food, growing food, growing produce, um, for just for manufacturing sake, um, resulted in a lot of food waste, resulted in a lot of food waste. There was a lot of pressure that it put on the business in terms of you know, needing to um, sell everything that we grow. So we actually took a step back from that. And when we started, and even to a certain extent today, everything that we do is grown to order. Um, so we work very, very, the, the, the agility that you talk about and the, the kind of the customer centricity that you talk about is a very big part of how we like to work. So let me let me give you an example. Um, so are you, uh, sorry to interrupt, are you building kind of lean principle six sigma into what you're doing from your management consulting background? Is that is that your idea? That, that you, 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 you've hit the nose, you, you've, hit, you've hit it there, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's kind of the combination of traditional agriculture with, you know, lean manufacturing principles, right? So the technical term for vertical farming is controlled environment agriculture. Um, vertical farming is a flavor of controlled environment agriculture. Greenhouses is another flavor of that, right? But what it means if you grow in a controlled environment is you can be very precise about all of the inputs of growth. So you can be very precise about the amount of light, the temperature, the humidity, the amount of nutrients that you give the plant, et cetera, et cetera. That means that you can optimize at every stage of the process. Um, which fundamentally means that you you can treat, we consider ourselves to be a manufacturing organization. We just so happen to be manufacturing green leafy vegetables. So it's it's about giving, it's about understanding that agility, where can we be more agile and how can we pass that on to our customers? So for example, um, I, we got the idea of a high-tech allotment from one of our customers because he was actually talking to an allotment grower three seasons ahead. So he was talking, I remember this very specifically, in the fall of 2018, he was talking to an allotment grower to grow him the squashes for fall 2019. So he was thinking three, you know, three to four seasons ahead. With us, because of the intensiveness of growing, because of how quickly things grow, we need people to think within four to six weeks. So let's say you're a you're a restaurateur and you have a 50 seat restaurant and in order to enable in order to and your summer menu looks like this where you know you need a bunch of lettuce you need 10 kilos of lettuce 10 kilos of coriander 10 kilos of basil um we'll only grow that for you um and we'll grow that for and so there's very little food waste and when your menu transitions from summer to autumn we'll just stop growing the stuff that as long as you give us four to six weeks notice, we'll just stop growing the stuff that you asked us to grow for the summer and we'll transition to growing the stuff that you want us to grow for the autumn. So, and, and it's imbibing that agility, imbibing agriculture with that agility that it didn't previously have. As you progress, though, and as you build up, you know, trading history and and a better you know, are able to profile customer behavior. Do you think you're going to be able to forecast better in terms of will we expect to grow X tons of produce for uh, this type? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're we're working with, um, and, and you're touching on a very interesting question in the sense of um, how we've segmented our customers, right? So, when we started off, we were working with you know Michelin star chefs and small restaurants. Um, we all know the chefs are divas. We all know that they're very picky and finicky, and they want the best produce at the perfect time. So, what would happen is that you know we would sometimes at, at that those early stages you know, change what we're growing on a weekly or monthly basis because of the demand from our customer. We've we've grown up a little since then. We still love working with chefs um, who kind of push the boundaries of, of that. But we also like working with kind of the, the larger restaurant groups who are much better at that process, much better at forecasting, much better at understanding exactly how much they need, much better at having sustainability programs, right? 
we're a we're a very small part of an organization's overall sustainability program, right? Like, you know, that can touch on everything from, you know, the sustainability of their plates, the, the sustainability of their tomato sauce, and the sustainability, in our case, of our basil, right? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I think um, we like working with um, the size of organization that kind of values the sustainable side of things. It's not, what, what we found is that it's about removing the, the, the dichotomy of choice and sustainability. Historically, you had to be either sustainable and only buy local, and therefore your choice is limited, or you don't care about sustainability and you'll get whatever it is that you want, regardless of where it comes from. So what we found is with vertical farming, that, that choice doesn't need to exist anymore. You can have pretty much anything you want, and it's also grown in a very sustainable way. Is there a downside, though, to working with the larger chains because, uh, unless they're London-focused, the food mile element uh, is, uh, you know, is, is more of a consideration so that they're, they're only going to want to buy for you, from you for part of their operation or is it just a trade-off that they, you know, they consider? Yeah, it is definitely a trade-off that they consider. Um, at the same time, you're underestimating how broken the food system actually is, right? Mm. Um, on average, the produce that you and I can buy from Sainsbury's will have traveled 2,000 miles and spend 11 weeks in the supply chain, right? So That's incredible. Yeah, I, I, for, for us, we go, because we only work with London at the moment, so it's kind of, you know, between 5 to 20 miles. Um, and we go from harvest to delivery in eight hours. Yes. Um, So, you know, that's a fundamental step change. Now, is it the ideal for us to grow something in London and ship it up to Manchester because we have a customer up there? That doesn't sound right to me, but it's still so much better than the, you know, historic, the historic problem, right? Um, Our vision is actually a network of connected, data-driven, sustainable farms, right? That is able to be responsive to demand. So if we have, you know, a farm in London, we have a farm in Birmingham, we have a farm in Edinburgh, and an order comes in from, I don't know, Manchester, then we should be able to understand where the capacity across the network is, where can we grow what what we're being asked to grow with a minimum amount of food miles in the most sustainable way. It does seem crazy that uh, a whole industry has grown around keeping things refrigerated and preserved for as long as possible to, you know, to make it economically viable to grow them overseas rather than fix the model and, and, you know, reduce, reduce the carbon emissions. Yeah. And, you know, have it you know the, the number, the, the number of, you know, bad, you know, the, the bad lettuce, right. There's a reason that stuff is gassed, right. Because it, it's not going to survive that supply chain. The number of ingredients that we never even get in this country because they won't survive that supply chain. There's no way that they would survive the supply chain. You know, lots of weird and wonderful Southeast Asian herbs, lots of weird and wonderful Mexican herbs that we either never, ever get here, or if we do get, get very rarely. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I've accidentally, you know, when we first started, I've accidentally, you know, well, I, I took some of my produce home and accidentally left it in the fridge for a couple of weeks. And, you know, within a couple, a couple of weeks gone by and it's still, perfect it's still beautiful right because of the go from harvest to delivery in a matter of hours um we know from experience that you know you open up a bag of you know mixed salad and it just goes soggy almost immediately um and you know that's a big part of that food waste problem so um going back to what you said about uh restaurant tech it's it's certainly something we've experienced that smaller restaurants we've worked with it it seems incredible but the kind of operational side of a of a restaurant in most cases is back of fact back at calculations oh we're running low on this order this um and it's surprising somehow that the technology hasn't come in because there's such an opportunity so many independent restaurants that could be you know manage that inventory better um and it and it's only the the chains that do it but they're doing it from a not a necessarily a quality of food perspective. It's from a you know, maximum efficiency, maximum profitability, rather than how can we get you know the the freshest food to the table. Um, that sounds right. Yeah, it, 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 if the independents were pushing for it, I think they'd be going. Well, how can I be more like you know Le Manoir, uh, Gary Jones? How can I get my my acre of herbs that I've got outside the back back window um, to the table rather than um, you know just just profit? Hopefully. No, that's absolutely right. You know, we find that the people we com- we we don't we very rarely actually compete with other vertical farms. Um, the people we compete with are you know the small 
just outside of London, incredible produce coming from, you know, small hold farms um, who make incredible produce. Um, you know, we find we compete with them more rather than because, you know, they also bring putting aside the verticality side of things. They they bring in, you know, sustainable, organic um, rather than, you know, and we're much closer to that than, you know, white labeled Tesco produce, for example. So you mentioned that uh, you know the the goal is this this network of, of smart systems you know interconnected data driven. Do you want to touch on a little bit of the technology that goes into you know how you run your your vertical farms? And I'm, I'm guessing like very sensor based, uh, lots of real time reporting. But you know, I'd, I'd love to know a bit about how you've developed that and 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 what it's been like as an innovation process. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, we. My background in management consulting, there's always been a technology side to to, to, to my previous job, um, you know, leading large multinational teams to deliver, you know, some sort of business process change to a large multinational. Um, so I, I have a I have a bit of a thing. I, I know enough about technology to be very dangerous with it. Um, so we made a purposeful choice at this when we started the company that we didn't want to play in the hardware space. I can go to 10 different um, engineering companies and ask them to build me a vertical farm. And they, all of them could do a, a, a better job than I could at mm. doing you know, the heavy hardware based bits of it right fundamentally a vertical farm is just a combination of you know, climate control system, HVAC, air conditioning. Um, lots and lots of complicated plumbing, um, and you know a, a a system that allows you to control the climate. Right? It's really kind of those three things. Um, so you know, my favorite suppliers, my favorite engineering partners, are the ones that are not reinventing the wheel. That are ones that are taking you know warehousing equipment um, and kind of bringing them together in kind of a system integrator kind of way, rather than saying you know here's my proprietary vertical farm because you know i don't think that's really kind of necessary so while we've not chosen you know so we work with our we we design our own farms but we don't and we work with our partners to design and build them um through through our sub through our partner network um but where we do like to play is in that kind of software kind of intelligence real-time reporting space so um we've built a tool um we're tentatively calling it farm force um and for you know it, it's essentially it's the brains of our farm right it, it's what allows us to operate these kind of it's, it's a, it, what we touched on earlier it's what allows us to um operate these kind of just-in-time manufacturing principles and combine that with farming combine that with agriculture so for example it holds all of our climate recipes it holds that you know we need to grow that this kind of basil grows under this climate with this nutrient mix and all, all of that kind of stuff um and that's something that we're continuing to iterate through. We're continuing to build. Um, we're building it in an agile manner. Um, is there any element of um, self-learning artificial intelligence to it, or is it very, you know, data-fed? But you know, you have to interrogate it to teach it. Yeah, n- not yet. But that is the direction that absolutely this industry is going in, um, right? And that's the direction that we want to take our our platform on. But the idea, the, the really, the, the kind of main idea, really, kind of behind Farm Force was. That because of that idea that I shared earlier, where I can go to 10 different companies and they will all say, oh, my vertical farming hardware is better than that guy's vertical farming hardware. I know that that's not true, right? They're all going to do pretty much the same thing. It's just a matter of how they go about it and how they do it. They will grow. You will grow basil under any of those, right? But what's happened is that it's because there are so many of these companies, what they've essentially created is data silos where you know, my hardware only works with my, my data only works with my hardware and it doesn't work with anyone else's. And that makes the overall kind of landscape a lot more fragmented and a lot, it's a lot harder to learn from each other. And it's a lot harder to, you know, take learnings from other places and apply it to your, the, the vision for farm force was really around breaking down those silos that it was about, regardless of what hardware you're using, you know, we could choose to go to a totally different hardware provider in the future but the data that the data can be consumed in one place and used in one place and learned from one place um you know driving that network of farms right that was really kind of the, the key behind it um and 
So yeah. how, how do you think you can present that data in the future? Is it that that someone can sort of feed data to you and you spit back a kind of a recipe? Or or is it that um, that you would just make the data available and people query it? How, you know, would you have a, a model envisaged for how it would work? <clears throat> Um, no is the perfect answer, uh, is, is the easy answer. All right. So we, we, I, I get asked all the time, do you want to license farm force out? Is that something that you want to kind of sell? Right. Um, and, 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 you know, venture capitalists all always ask me this. Um, and my short answer is no, not, not at this stage, right. We are very, very focused on, um, building our production capacity, building of, of being a farm. Right. Um, we need to be very data driven. We need to be very technology enabled, but we're really kind of building it for ourselves. But the idea is that, you know, um, so you keep the silos then for the time being, for the time, for the time being, at least. Um, but but going back to your point around going back to your point around the um, how that data is being used. Right. Right now, there's still. No one's cracked this yet, but there's always going to be a human driven um, optimization process. Let me, the best oh, example that I, well, the best example I can think of is taste, for example. We can optimize taste using machine learning, sorry, we can optimize for yield using computer vision and machine learning very easily. You know, stick a camera down, pointing down at a plant, and you, it can watch it grow, and you can measure how much it's growing over time very easy to do like it's 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 already been done um there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to, to kind of make it industrial and scalable but there's already startups that are doing that sort of thing where i think the really interesting bit is is in the subjective side right yes i know that you know increasing the temperature by one percent has increased yield by eight percent for example um but do i know if that's created a very tasty basil is it spicier than the last basil that I tasted or not, right? Like those kinds of softer things um, are, are much, much harder to do in a kind of systematic way. But I think that's the direction that this industry is going, right? Like real-time sensing of flavonoids, real-time sensing mm. of nutrition within certain plants and being I'm able to actually can quantify you ex- that. Can you expect much of a, a deviation in terms of flavor? from one batch to another what how, how consistent can you expect these to be um in terms so there are two questions there in terms of consistency within a single batch it's very very consistent because you know fundamentally it's a perfect summer day every time every day in the farm so you know the, the environment is very very consistent but in terms of flavor profile outside of, of over time mm. it, it, you can get very very dry, you know Light, there's a lot of research happening. Light seems to be a very big determinant of that. Light and heat. Um, oh, sorry, temperature. Um, right. If you, so for example, um, our farm operates at 200 U moles um, in terms of the light intensity. Um, and that's perfect for something like basil, right? You give it too much light and you get the flavors that you get from basil are, are, off and they're they're too astringent they're too strong and you don't get that kind of beautiful freshness from it um you're actually you've actually asked the question one of the one of the most interesting things that i learned about vertical farming particularly in the early days was a a research paper that came out of mit where they did um what they did was they essentially grew basil under blue and red light so plants only consume blue and red light but you grow basil under more blue light than red light. And what you end up producing is a spicier basil. So you start getting into the realms of designer produce. You start getting into the realms of GMO without it being GMO, um, right? Just by kind of um, encouraging the natural processes yeah. in a plant, you're encouraging Purely environmental more environmental rather than anything. Exactly. To imposing but so obviously the, the, if you change the environment the product will taste different but as long as the, the environment is different the nutrients are the same you've kept it growing for the same amount of time it should taste pretty much the same right yeah absolutely yeah it's, it's exciting to think that in the the future could be sending a recipe from one location to another rather than sending a product from one location that to is another. absolutely right right that is absolutely right um you know and that's that is you know think about you know um 
shipped missions to Mars and ship, you know, missions to the moon, right? There's no yep. reason to ship soil or ship a basil seedling, right? As long as you know how to grow it, you should be able to grow it anywhere. Yeah, that's really exciting. But uh, coming back to an earlier point you made about how you'd taken the decision to focus on the software side and on the, the growing side, you know, stay away from the hardware side. I think that's a really uh, useful kind of process to talk to the, the fact that you had this this opportunity to kind of take you know the idea of vertical farming any way that you wanted to you could have said oh we're going hardware but you've you've taken the this this decision to say no we're going to focus on the growing of the food yes we will develop technology yes it, we are we're, we're keen on software but for the time being that is for our purposes yes there may be a secondary licensing uh, of that but that's that's part of the value of the business and and hence we don't want to give that away before we're, we're ready to and before we, we, we've decided how we're going to use it and i think um there's so many startups out there that decide to do too many things uh and i i, I wonder if that do you feel that's helped you focus and made you more competitive in the market are there, are there other people out there who tried to do too much perhaps I, I think it I, I think you're right that it is something that kind of startups do right startups are very opportunistic trying to you know take the, the the opportunities that are given to them, which kind of makes them lose focus. And I think it's certainly in in kind of vertical farming, um, it's very, very capital intensive. Um, you know, the, 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 the capital expenditure at the start of the process is very high. Um, so, you know, needing to focus and, and how that has defined things like our business model, right? We couldn't have started with, um, groceries because we just didn't have that scale. Um, we couldn't, and, and, and I, and I think you had the nail on the head there where you said, you know, it is about doing too much and it's about focusing and it's about, you know, you know, building a vertical farm, considering the challenges that it already has is hard enough building a vertical farm and building hardware on the back of it just sounds very hard. <laughs> sounds very expensive. Yeah. So expensive. touching on that capital side, how was the fundraising journey for you? You mentioned you, you speak to a lot of VCs, you know, is that, is that a process you're, you're currently is ongoing? Um, it is. Yes. Um, so we've, you know, it, it's, we started off our kind of fundraising journey um, through a crowdfunding round. Um, we had an angel investor. Um, we then topped that up with a crowdfunding round. So we raised about 400,000 pounds to start. And that's really what's driven this next stage of growth. Um, it took us, um, we've raised another um, close to half a million pounds on the back of that. Um, and that was from the government's future fund, which was a COVID response thing. Um, so we're in a very strong position now where we're actually able to say, and, and this is exactly what the future fund this is exactly what the future one was supposed to do, right? It's kind of um, pushing for that green recovery, right? Was a, is a big part of what the government is trying to do. Um, but, you know, it seems most of my job at the moment is all about fundraising. So we're currently in the process of planning for our, so the, the farm that we are currently operating out of um, is almost sold out already. I mean, it's only been open for two months. Um, so we're, you know, and again, this was always the vision, right? It's about, it's about building the next one after that, and it's building the, that network of farm. The farms that we're planning right now are thirty times our current size, um, because just like any other manufacturing organization, this is not a business that works at small scales. This is a business that necessitates the economies of scale, but in, in, and one of those challenges is also, you know, ramping up production. Um, so yeah, we're actively think, fundraising right now. Touching on touching on the small scale element, do you think um, there is any future of vertical farming being something that the consumer gets into themselves? Do you think there's any sort of distribution or open sourcing of, of this in the future? I think that's already started. Um, you know, there are small, uh, there are products out there that are designed for home growing. I have one in my kitchen. It's called a Click and Grow. Um, you know, it's essentially just a water reservoir with some holes in it, which you put some substrate with some seeds in it, and you never have to buy a basil plant from Sainsbury's again. Um, but that, you know, you can buy things like fridges. They look like a fridge, but essentially inside it is just like a bunch of lights. Um, so I, I do think that we are heading in that way where more and more um, people will be able to grow their own food. Um, but I don't think 
I think we're quite a while away from, you know, being able to do everything, right? One of the things that we've kind of kind of hinge on is the fact that our cosmopolitan tastes are never going to change, right? We've already experienced what it's like to, you know, be able to get a Mexican burrito whenever I want, Vietnamese pho whenever I want. Um, so it's about creating an environment where I can still get those, you know, exotic foods without having to rely on ingredients that have been flown in from everywhere. Um, and doing that at home, I think, is kind of a, a logical next step. There's always going to be, you know, we have to feed 9 billion mouths by 2050. So, you know, this is one of the ways in which we can do that. Brilliant. So you mentioned that the, the farms you're planning, they're significantly bigger than what you've currently got. Is is part of that, um, you know, going to be expanding into other locations? Are, are you hoping to have a net, like, how quickly does the network come together, do you think? Very quickly, I hope. <laughs> um, but, but does adding know, a are... network, does adding a network add to the complexity of managing your just-in-time system? I mean, is is there going to be sort of trying to balance stock levels between locations and trying to react sort of nationwide to demand? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the taglines that we use is we don't sell produce; we sell the capacity to grow produce. Right. Mm -hmm. So the way that we work is because of the challenges of the business. Um, we want to work very closely with our customers. So, for example, one of one of our customers has essentially signed up to um, buy all of their basil from us for the next three years, right? And they knew exactly how much basil they use on a yearly basis. And they came to us and were like, could we do that with you guys? And, and we, absolutely they could, right? So... Um, it's about determining, it's not being, while we want to be more agile than traditional agriculture, it's also about being able to put in place these kind of large, long-term contracts that allow us, that allow the business the stability to be able to operate in multiple different places and at the same time um, respond. So, for example, um, you know, when, when we say that the farm is operating at 100% capacity, we don't actually mean 100% capacity. We mean it's operating at 90% capacity because we put 10% of each farm aside for R&D, where we grow lots of weird and wonderful things. If we want to grow, if we want to prove to this customer that has just walked in that we can grow him coriander or we can grow chives or dill or whatever it is, we always have the space in everyone. And, you know, we consider it to be just one, it's just a dispersed location, right? We, we know exactly where the space is doesn't matter where that space is, but we know that farm is operating at 87% capacity and therefore it has the capacity to do to produce X. That farm's operating at 65% capacity and that, that, right? that's what that's part of what Farm Force does for us. This is very exciting. So um, is there is there a, a top tip you can sort of advise for a startup founder who's thinking, yes, I have a business idea, software is part of it, but maybe not maybe not the immediate product that's being sold is is there a direction you'd give someone um i got asked this question very recently um and the answer that i gave then was around you know finding customers is easy finding the right customer is a lot harder we've been we've turned potential customers away because they didn't quite get it or the model didn't quite work for them and we've now found kind of a slew of customers who, you know, are very passionate about the sustainability side, totally get what we're trying to do and have become our advocates um, and, you know, are, are introducing us to a lot of their buddies in the restaurant industry and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so I think it's about finding the right first customer. It's about finding the right first couple of customers who are going to be you know, and I think that's that's one of the best bits of advice that I can give, right? Like, like if if you actually have received, if you actually have achieved kind of product market fit, your first few customers should be your biggest advocates. Excellent advice, and uh, yeah, really uh, really enjoyed our chat today, and um, best of luck with the future for, for Harvest London. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thanks for joining. Remember to subscribe and follow us and to share today's insights with other businesses you know who want to stay relevant in a digital first world.